Thanks. Good morning. Uh, jury selection is a vast topic, and I know very little about it. But what I know about it is probably different than what you know about it. You might know, many of you I see out there have tried many more cases to juries than I have, and you might know 5% of everything that there is to know about jury selection. And I might know 2% of everything that there is to know about jury selection. But if my 2% is different than your 5% and I can convey part of that 2% to you, then I think I will have done my job here today. I'd like to talk about three topics today. The first one is some interesting legal questions in jury selection. And I have, there's a paper for you. I wrote a paper which uh, has the law as it stands now on jury selection. It's in your, your uh, book. You don't have to follow along. There's not going to be any following along. But if you want to know the law of jury selection, go to the paper. Moreover, I've included in there boxes with checklists, preser preservation of error checklists, for example, uh, that I think might be helpful to you in trial, whichever side of the, of the courtroom you're sitting on. Uh, so take a look at the paper at your convenience. If you want a reference for the law of jury selection, I, I, I think I've covered it. And if you want the, the little tables for your trial notebook, um, call me or email me, and I can, uh, I can send you those separately. Excuse me. So first, I want to talk about interesting legal questions, things that kind of got me thinking while I was writing the paper. Second, I'd like to talk about a little science, the science of jury selection, which I think as criminal lawyers on, on both sides, uh, we neglect. Uh, and I say we neglect, I, we neglect compared to the civil lawyers who are fighting over money and so have lots of money to fight over money, uh, have paid a lot more attention to the science of the matter than we have. And I think that there are some things that we can adopt into our practices to pick more. Sir, walking down the aisle, you just dropped your flash drive in the green shirt. Green shirt, blue sleeves, just dropped your flash drive. Uh, things that we can adopt to, to get m more fair and more accurate juries. And finally, I'd like to talk about some simple rules for better jury selection. I wrote a paper on this for the Jury Expert, which is the, uh, the magazine of the, the National the American Society of Trial Consultants. That's in your materials as well. I anticipate that we won't get through all 16 rules in my talk here, but they're in the paper, and I hope to give you a taste of them in my talk. And if you're interested, you can go and look at the rest of them and give them some thought and maybe communicate with me about them. So, interesting legal questions. Preserving error when there's an improper comment to the panel, that is, when the court or the prosecutor says something to the panel that, that is improper or not, cor uh, not correct. Preserving error, uh, showing harm, more specifically, when the court improperly excuses a juror on its own hook, sua sponte. And then preserving error when the defense is barred from asking a proper question of the jury panel. Finally, uh, religious tests in jury selection, which is an issue that, that hasn't been litigated, but I think is ripe for litigation. So jury panel hears, hears improper comments. I was thinking about an example of an improper comment that the jury panel might hear, and I thought, well, maybe something like the judge suggests that it's the, the uh, it's because of some poor decision of the defense that, that we're picking a jury here today. You know, uh, I'm sure the state has offered a very generous plea offer, but the defendant has turned it down. Yeah. Okay, so object, right? On the record, timely and specific objection and, and uh, instruction to disregard. And this is just standard error preservation. Keep going until you are denied. So on the record, timely and specific objection, instruction to disregard, move to strike the jurors who heard the comments. And case law says that, that this, there is case law, that's, and it's in the paper, that says that this is, this is preservation of error when the panel hears improper comments. In jury selection, by the way, rather than a motion for mistrial, which is what we would usually do after a, a a motion to strike an instruction to disregard, uh, a motion to strike the panel 
is the, is the proper thing to ask for. I think if you ask for a mistrial at that point, the Court of Appeals is going to know what it is you're talking about. The judge certainly should know what it is you're talking about. But motion to strike the panel is the appropriate uh, next step in error preservation. But there's a case called Hammett versus State that says that, that after moving to strike the jurors who, who heard the comments, uh, the defendant has to exhaust his peremptories. And, uh, and in the, the, the specific language of the case is, well, the appellant had sufficient peremptory challenges to have removed each juror that he now complains of who sat on the panel, and therefore he didn't show harm. Well, where the whole panel heard the comments, a motion to strike the panel should be sufficient to, to show harm. But in jury selection generally, we have the, the Anson four-step process for, for showing harm. And Hammond, Hammett is sort of a clue that, that even if what we've done really has shown the judge what the error of his ways is and given him an opportunity to correct it, that we still want to go further to show the Court of Appeals that we're really doing everything that we can to, to correct this error. So even though moving to strike the, uh, the panel ought to be enough, because everybody on the panel heard the comments, uh, there's no point in getting more strikes just to strike some of them. It's either all or nothing, in other words. Uh, the, the Court of Criminal Appeals has suggested that we need to go through the, the Anson four-step process, which I'll, I'll have a separate slide for in a moment, to show harm. The harm, of course, is that jurors who heard the improper comments served on the jury. So the takeaway for the trial lawyer here is always, in voir dire, if you think that the, the court has made a mistake, exhaust peremptories, request additional peremptories, show that an objectionable juror has served. The next interesting question is when the court improperly excuses a juror sua sponte. In Green, Green against the state in 1989, the Court of Criminal Appeals sh uh, held that we show harm in that case by showing that the state exhausted its peremptory challenges. So the state could, according to Green versus state, uh, avoid harm where the court improperly excused a juror sua sponte by not using all its peremptories. And, and the thinking is that if the state hasn't used all its peremptories, then if the court hadn't excused that juror on its own hook, then the state might have done so instead, so there's no harm. In Jones versus State, though, the Court of Criminal Appeals held that, that in order to preserve error, the defendant also has to show that he was deprived of a lawfully constituted jury. Well, that's when the state's challenge for cause is denied. So, so the question is, and I think it's an open question, I think we know how it's going to be resolved. Uh, two cases nine years apart. One is the court improperly excusing, and the next is the state's challenge being, being erroneously granted. Well, why shouldn't the same standard apply to the court improperly excusing a juror as to the state improperly striking a juror or the state's peremptory challenge being, being improperly granted. It's, it's the same effect on the defendant. That is, somebody is, some juror is released who should not have been. And I think that the outcome of this is going to be, uh, Jones uh, is going to be that even when the, when the court improperly excuses a juror as when a state strike is improperly allowed, that we're going to have to show deprivation of a lawfully constituted jury, which, as a practical matter, is not going to happen. Uh, there hasn't been a case that I know of since Jones in which a court has found an improperly constituted jury. Improperly constituted jury means uh, we have a right to a lawful jury. We don't have a right to a particular 12 jurors. So as long as the 12 jurors who, who served were qualified to serve, I think the Court of Appeals can say, well, it's not unlawfully constituted. The third interesting legal issue, well, I'll get to in just a moment. Y'all have to be familiar with the four-step process for showing harm in voir dire. Well, you defense lawyers have to be, you have to know this. If you're going to be picking juries, you, this has to be, 
the first page of your jury selection notebook, okay? In order to show harm, and people say to preserve error, more specifically, this is to show harm. You have to show that you exhausted your peremptory challenges, that you asked for more, that your request was denied, and that you had to, an, had to accept an objectionable person as a result. And you have to show who that objectionable person was. You know, judge, I've used up all my peremptories. Could I please have another peremptory? You can't have another peremptory. Okay, judge, because I couldn't have another peremptory. Juror number 17 uh, is serving on this juror. I'm forced to accept this, this juror on the, from the panel who is objectionable to me because I couldn't have another peremptory challenge. So when the defendant is barred from asking a proper question, well, Anson was that sort of case where the defendant was barred from asking a proper question. And so the four-step process was required to show harm where the defendant was not allowed to ask a specific question and answer. In Rich, the Court of Criminal Appeals noted that, that taking the step of exhausting peremptory challenges and requesting more wouldn't have helped. It wouldn't have cured the harm since the error extended to the, the entire veneer. The defendant was barred from asking this question to the whole veneer, and so striking one more or two more jur jurors and then asking for more challenges wouldn't have cured the harm. In Rich, the court, Janey, mentioned the, the 44.2a and b harm analyses. In the Texas Rules of Appellate Procedure, Rule 44.2b covers constitutional harm. And in order for constitutional harm to not be reversed, the court has to find beyond a reasonable doubt that it was not harmless which is, should be a difficult thing for a court to find. Uh, I have quibble with appellate judges who are a little cavalier with the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt when they're dealing with, uh, with harm. Rule 44.2a is the non-constitutional harm. Uh, I'm sorry, I have it backwards. 40, Rich, Rich applied 44.2b, which is non-constitutional harm. Jones, in 2007, applied 44.a, 44.2a, which is the constitutional harm test. So in Rich, the, the court noted that exhausting the peremptories wouldn't have cured the problem, but then applied the 44.2b easy analysis. In Jones, the Court of Criminal Appeals applied the 44.2a analysis under the theory that we have a right to be heard in court and the right to question jurors is a part of the Texas Constitution's right to be heard. I think it's Article 1, Section 10. In Story, in 2010, an unpublished Court of Criminal Appeals opinion, the Court of Criminal Appeals went back to the Anson four-step test and 44.2b to test for harm in the situation where uh, the defendant had been barred from asking a proper question. So we've got four Court of Criminal Appeals cases, we've got four different tests, but essentially what it comes down to is 44.2a or 44.2b, which applies when the defendant is barred from asking a proper question. And I think, uh, well, in Jones, which was a, a 44.2a case, the court said, well, look, in Rich we applied 44.2b, but that's just because the appellant in Rich didn't argue 44.2a. So I think the takeaway for this for the trial lawyer is to make the constitutional objection if you're barred from asking a proper question. You know, judge, we have a right to be heard under the Texas Constitution. Mark says it's Article, 40, Article 1, Section 10, but look it up in my paper before you, before you say that. Uh, under Article 1, Section 10, we've got a right to be heard, and this is a constitutional violation. The takeaway for the appellate lawyer is don't assume that the less stringent uh, harm analysis applies, in fact, argue for the more stringent one to apply. So those are the in interesting legal questions that came up for me when I was writing the paper. Uh, this is something that, that I've been pondering for some time, is religious tests. How many prosecutors are left here today? Okay, cool. So you know this question. Is there anyone here who, because of their religious beliefs, is unable to judge other people? Right? Standard question in jury selection, because what you're looking for is the people who, who have been taught, judge not lest ye be judged, and who are going to take that into the criminal courthouse, and they're not going to be able to 
to find a person guilty because they've been told, judge not lest ye be judged. Well, I have an issue with that. My issue is Texas Constitution Article 1, Section 4 says no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust in the state. The office of juror is an office and a public trust. And does your religion bar you from judging other people is a religious test. So does excluding a juror because of religious beliefs violate the Texas Constitution? It's an unlitigated question. By the way, the, the question, this is a, a bad way to phrase the question, is there anyone here who, uh, and it's for a reason that I'll discuss in the third part of this talk, the, the better way to ask the question, which is probably how you do it, is how many of you, because of your religious beliefs, are not, unable to judge other people? The Supreme Court has, has addressed a similar question in Wainwright v. Witt, 1985, and Witherspoon v. Illinois in 1968, but those cases dealt with the defendant's Sixth Amendment rights rather than the juror's rights to serve. And so the issue of whether a juror's right to serve is violated by, some, by him being stricken because of his religious beliefs that bar him from judging uh, is an unlitigated one. What objections would you make? Article 1, Section 4, which is the Texas Constitution Religious Test Clause. Article 6, Section 3, which is the US Constitution Religious Test Clause. Article 1, Section 6, which is the Texas Rights of Conscience Clause. And then the First Amendment, of course, which is the Free Exercise Clause. Also, I would argue, that it's an improper commitment question. An improper commitment question is like a sledgehammer in jury selection. Because so many of the questions that, that we habitually ask, if you really look at them and kind of investigate the question, it's a commitment question. We try to get jurors committed to things. That's what we're trying to do. So it is a commitment question. Will you be able to judge? But it's an improper commitment question, and here's why. Because the juror oath doesn't require the juror to judge anyone. Now, we might think, think of it as judging, but the person whose who's, uh, religious tenets say, judge not lest ye be judged, might not look at it as judging at all. It's rendering unto Caesar. It's following the law. So it's an improper commitment question. It violates the juror's right to serve. And uh, quite frankly, we know what you're really doing when you ask the question. Because we know it's not the, the middle class white folk who are answering the question, yeah, my religion says, judge not lest ye be judged. It's the, you know, it's the lower middle class black folk. It's the, it's the folk who go to, uh, um, uh, who go to the, the, the evangelical church in the neighborhood. And I see heads being shaken. Okay, that's not what you're doing. A little science to get away from the law. The, the, the personal injury lawyers have been messing around with this. There are jury experts who get paid lots of money to help lawyers pick juries. We don't see it a lot in the criminal courthouse because most of the time, frankly, defendants don't have the money to hire the experts and uh, neither does the state. The state doesn't have the budget to bring in the people and maybe on a high profile case, both sides will have the budget. Uh, but we need to know about a little bit of, of science. And here, what I want to talk about is psychology. Let's look at how, well, first of all, let's talk about what we really want to ask when we have a jury panel in front of us. What we really want to ask is, on these facts, Mr. or Ms. Juror, what would you do, right? Which is a commitment question, an improper commitment question. We can't ask the question, but that's really what we want to know. We want to take each of these people aside out of the hearing of, of our adversary and say, okay, so here's the situation. This is what's going on. This is the evidence you're going to hear. Are you for me or against me? And we can't ask that, which, we, which would take all the fun out of it anyway, probably. If we could, if we, I mean, that's the trial. You know, we tell them what the facts are about, we, we see what they're going to decide. So Clarence Darrow had a theory about picking jurors. He said, if a Presbyterian enters the jury box and carefully rolls up his umbrella and calmly and critically sits down, let him go. He is cold as the grave, and so forth. More Darrow. 
An Irishman is called into the box for examination. Is Jack Carroll here? No. There is no reason for asking about his religion. He is Irish. That is enough. And this was 1936 when he wrote this for Esquire magazine. And I think in 1936, this might have worked a lot better than it does now. But if you see somebody of Irish heritage in America now, then they're not first or second generation. And they've melted into the melting pot. Beware of the Lutherans, especially the Scandinavians. They are almost always sure to convict. You may defy all the rest of the rules if you can get a man who laughs. And I agree with this one. Few things in this world are of enough importance to warrant considering them seriously, so by all means, choose a man who laughs. So what's Clarence Darrow doing? What he's doing is trying to guess at how people are going to rule for or against his clients based on their religion, based on their national origin, based on whether they laugh. And so what we've got is successive approximations where we're trying to answer that question, Mr. Mister, what, what are you going to do? Are you for me or against me? Without asking the question. So Darrow might look at him and see the Presbyterian coming in with a tightly rolled umbrella and say, no. And what he's doing is, it, think of it as a Christmas present. He's got this box, and the box is the juror, and there's a lovely Christmas present inside, or there's something really cruddy inside, and he's looking at the wrapping paper and trying to figure out what's inside the package, right? That's what we do when we stereotype. And the way that we pick juries now, with the, the time limits that were given, and especially in federal court, where the time limit for the, juror, for the lawyer's voir dire might be zero, we, we have to. We're forced, we're compelled to stereotype. Now, you know, the stereotypes may not, we may have our own stereotypes. We may not agree with Clarence Darrow about who's good and who's not. But we're forced to look at a limited amount of information in a non-capital case and decide based on very limited information whether we want the person on the juror or not, whether they're for us or against us. So there's a company in Houston called JuryQuest. And JuryQuest takes this, this, this approximation of what's in the package and takes it a, a little step farther on down the road. What JuryQuest does is looks at the information on the jury forms and they have a database saying, OK, generally people who are school teachers, who are 50 to 55 years old, who are divorced, and who are white, are better jurors for one side or for the other. And grade, they grade the jurors with a numerical grade. And this is, this is guessing what's in the gift, not just by looking at the wrapping paper, but by, by picking it up, by shaking it, by sniffing it, by, you know, by listening to it and thinking, OK, you know, I've, I've got this database of 100,000 other gifts, and this is most like that one. So I'm going to guess that this gift is going to be like that gift in the database. So we can get actually to a nearer approximation than that, something that, that the jury quest data is based on. There's a measurable psychological trait that can help us predict what a juror is going to do. Convict or acquit, uh, be severe on punishment or be less severe on punishment, whether they're for us or against us. We can measure this trait. We lawyers can measure this trait. We can ask the jurors the, question, the questions that tell us, OK, what is, what, what is your, where do you scale in this psychological trait? The trait is legal authoritarianism. Authoritarianism has been found to correctly predict verdicts more often than any other trait measured, which is not to say that it's perfect, but there is a correlation between legal authoritarianism and convictions and punishment. It's one of the most effective predictors of mock jurors' decisions in criminal cases. In, in uh, insanity cases, it has been shown to predict the decision. So psychologists test for legal authoritarianism. This is a con concept from psychology. The articles you'll find about it are in the psych uh, psychological jour uh, journals for the most part. Psychologists have the revised legal attitudes questionnaire. It's 30 Likert scaled questions. And here's the Likert scale. Likert scale is strongly agree, 
to strongly agree, and then either four, five, or seven, generally, uh, hash marks on the scale. So that strongly disagree might be one, and strongly disagree might be five, or might be seven, or might be four. Uh, the, the advantage of four is that there's no neutral. It forces people to choose either agree or disagree. But this Likert scale is one that I've used uh, as a, it, with, with authoritarian, authoritarianism questions in my group Vordire. So 30 Likert scale questions. Uh, a psychologist named Kravitz cut it down to 23 in the revised legal attitudes questionnaire 23. And the questions are things like these. Here's, here are the 30 questions of the RLAC. I know you can't read that. Uh, but one of the questions is, too many obviously guilty persons escape punishment because of legal technicalities. And the F means it's in the, the cut down 23 question uh, questionnaire as well. So the jurors would be asked to scale their agreement or disagreement with this question. Too many obviously guilty persons escape punishment because of legal technicalities. And you can kind of look at it and say, OK, someone who strongly agrees with that is someone who is more authoritarian. And you can just kind of intuitively say, you know, I'm a prosecutor. And if I had a choice between somebody who believes that too many obviously guilty people escape punishment because of technicalities and somebody who strongly disagrees with that, I'd rather have the person who strongly agrees. You might say, I don't agree with it myself, you know, because I don't think that there are technicalities. I think that the, the law is the law and should be equally applied to everybody. But I'd rather have somebody who takes that position than somebody who doesn't. Or if you're a defense lawyer, you can see, OK, you know, I know people who Thanksgiving dinner try to get in my face and argue with me and say, you know, too many obviously guilty people escape punishment because of legal technicalities. And I don't want to have Thanksgiving dinner with them much less have them on my jury. Another question, uh, defendants in a criminal case should be required to take the witness stand. Not a, are they required? And I've used this in, in jury selection. I explained to the jury, look, you know, the law has been explained to you. I just want to hear what you think the law should be. And you'd be surprised at how many people agree or strongly disagree after being told what the law is, that the law should be otherwise. A society with true freedom and equality for all would have very little crime. And you can see here that, that the first two are phrased one way, so that a strongly agree will give you an authoritarian. And the third one is phrased the opposite way, reverse. If you look at the, the abbreviation afterwards, it's AA comma R. R means reverse. That means a high score on this question suggests less authoritarianism. <clears throat> well, that's odd. OK, so application ideas. How do we use this? We can use part of the questionnaire in individual voir dire or in group voir dire. What I'll do is I'll have, at the end of my voir dire, if I have time that I think I can have dealt with the human beings, uh, conversed with them, if I think I have some time left over, I will, uh, I'll put up some of these questions on the screen. And I'll, I'll go through the list and ask people, OK, on this question, uh, one to five, strongly disagree to strongly agree, where are you? And you know, first juror might say four, and second juror might say three, and, you know, and so on through the, the entire panel, or at least through what I think the strike zone is. I think we ought to be doing it in a written questionnaire, though. I think it's, a, a, it's not a great use of our valuable time in Vordire, especially where our time is, is severely restricted. I think that, that we would all benefit if judges would allow us to give jurors a written questionnaire. Judge, look, it's a 23-question questionnaire. There's nothing intrusive about it. It's asking for attitudes about the criminal justice system. And we can really get a lot of information from this. Look, it's a one-page questionnaire. I've got it in triplicate. And, uh, with, and, I'll, and I've got pens. And we'll hand it out. And there's going to be a copy for the court. And there's going to be a copy for me. And there's going to be a copy for the other side. In Harris County, and I suspect in Bear County and Dallas County and Tarrant County, uh, but I don't know about the smaller counties, jurors coming in to serve waste a lot of time. They come in and they sit and they sit around for a while before they're broken up into panels and then they're moved to a different room and then they sit around for a while before they're taken to the courtroom and then they sit around for a while before lawyers and start to talk to them. 
So this, I think, would be a good use of, of some of that time. I think the jurors would benefit from having their time more efficiently used because nobody has to be uh, proctoring them when they're answering these questions. And the lawyer's time would be more efficiently used because we would get this piece of paper which would tell us where these jurors are on this scale. Especially in federal court. How many of you try cases in federal court? Okay, you get a lot of voir dire? No, you, often you get no voir dire at all. And let me tell you why. This is a little bit of digression. In federal court, the judges are not trying to get information about the jurors. They're trying to qualify the jurors. That's the judge's goal in federal court. So that's why in federal court, and, and a lot of you, you know, prosecutors may not even, even have seen this, but you get a judge up there uh, who asks questions like, how many of you won't follow the law? And when the guy in the black dress asks you if you're going to follow the law or not, you tell the guy in the black dress that you're going to follow the law. How many of you can't be fair? Uh, come on, judge. You know, that, that doesn't give us any useful information. I had a, a case that I, uh, <coughs> those of you from Houston know my friend Norm Silverman. And Norm was trying a case before Judge Atlas. And uh, he got individual voir dire in this case before Judge Atlas. And we had, the, it, was a, it was a drug case, Norm tries drug cases. And he got to do his individual voir dire and just, just struck the whole panel. We, we uh, you know, there, there weren't enough jurors left after, after Norm's voir dire because they were honest with him and they told him what they thought about, about you know, certain facts in the case. The guy was, uh, was Nigerian, that wasn't helpful to the, uh, uh, to the jurors' desire to be, um, to be fair in the case or their ability to be fair in the case, to be fair. So, so we, uh, uh, we lost the old jury panel. And the next day, Judge Atlas had us come back and do it again it, only this time, she didn't allow the lawyers to do any voir dire. And we got the jury picked out of the first 30 people. And the difference wasn't the panel. The demographics on the first panel were actually more favorable to the defense than the demographics on the second panel. The difference was lawyer voir dire versus judge voir dire and people doing voir dire who want to get information compared to somebody doing voir dire who just wants to get a jury picked. And nothing against Judge Atlas. Judge Atlas is one of the best... Uh, federal judges we have in town, but that's just the way federal judges work. They're trying to get a jury picked. So a written questionnaire, next time I try a, a federal case, I'm going to propose a written questionnaire, and, and the major part of the written questionnaire is going to be the RLAC, or the RLAC 23. Third application idea is to talk to an expert. There's a guy in El Paso, for those of you out in El Paso, uh, Stephen J. Ross is in Dr. Malpass's eyewitness ID lab, and he has written about the RLAC. And if I were out in El Paso and I wanted to, to consider doing a more scientific jury selection, I might talk to him and say, hey, can you help me write up a jury questionnaire that we can pass out to these jurors, or can you help me pick a few of these questions that I can ask these jurors that'll give us some information about their authoritarianism? So this is a sample of what I might put up on the screen or, uh, no, well, what I, what I might well, put up on the screen or put up on a, on a, a poster board, a, a foam core, for a jury panel to ask them one of these questions. So, you know, strongly disagree, disagree somewhat, neutral, agree somewhat, or strongly agree, defendants in a criminal case should be required to take the witness stand. And if I were to redo this, I might take out neutral. I might take out that option, because I don't think it's something that people ought to be neutral about in this scenario. And simple rules for better jury selection. I think I've got 16 of them. Um, you might call it 17. They change. Last time I picked a jury, I looked at my simple rules afterwards and realized that I had pretty much neglected all of them. And I did a pretty crappy job of picking a jury. Um, my friend Richard Alpert, where's Richard? Richard, um, when he gave his talk on voir dire in, in DWI cases, joked that, that defense lawyers should go and do something else. And yeah, uh, very, very droll. I learned a lot from Richard's talk on voir dire, and there's nothing that, that he said that I disagree with. There's nothing that uh, David Burroughs said that I disagree with either. But I'd like the prosecutors to, to pay special attention to the simple rules for better jury selection. Because there are subliminal messages encoded that are going to make you want to leave the side of the government 
and come join me in defending your brothers and sisters who fall short of perfection and are accused of crime. So pay close attention, and uh, I hope the subliminal messaging will work. Simple rules. That's a fractal, and it's a drawing based on a fairly simple mathematical equation that no matter what level you look at it at, no matter how deep you go, looks basically the same. You see the same patterns repeating. You've got that, that uh, kind of heart-shaped thing in the middle of the screen, which you'll just see over and over and over as you go deeper and then as you, as you back out. Jury selection is the interaction of 60 plus human brains. And you, know, you reach up and you, you touch your head. Inside is the most complex thing in the universe. It's not possible to build a computer to do what your brain does. And in Vordire, you've got one of these brains, this impossibly complex six pound thing, interacting with maybe 60 others at the same time. And each one is constantly sending and receiving signals, words, body language, facial expressions. So, so given the complexity of this, and like I said at the beginning, I know very little about Bordar, what good are simple rules? And this is only a guide. The idea here is better jury selection. It's not perfect jury selection. And for the prosecutors, you know, you're my opening act. And I don't like it when you hand me a cold jury panel. I would really, all, all joking aside, I would like for you to do a good job in jury selection. I don't want you to do a great job. I don't want you to have them eating out of the palm of your hand. But I would like you to at least warm them up for me. You know, when Led Zeppelin went on the road, Led Zeppelin didn't pick the worst possible bands for, for opening acts. Led Zeppelin picked acts that would actually warm up the audience. And so, I would rather, I've had discussions with, with the criminal defense lawyers who, believe it or not, are bigger zealots than me, um, who, who say, no, you shouldn't be teaching jury selection to prosecutors. Well, I, I disagree. I think that, that a good jury selection makes for a better trial, and I think that, that a prose good prosecutorial jury selection helps to make for a good defense jury selection. Because if you hand them off to me and they're cold, there's not a whole lot that I can do to get them warmed up. Because if they've been sitting there being bored for an hour, it's going to take some energy to get, them, to get them talking. So rule zero, the purpose of jury selection in a non-capital case, it's not primarily about selecting a jury. If it were, we could go the federal route and say, OK, you know, let's pick the first 12 people who aren't going to cop to being biased. The purpose of jury selection is to bond with the jury. The purpose of jury selection is to tell your story. The purpose of jury selection is to find strikes. And the purpose of jury selection is to insulate, well, doubters for the defense, true believers for the prosecution. Okay? To protect, what did Richard say? He said to protect, protect the people who are on his side. To get them conditioned so that that they're not subject to strikes. Rule one is the Nike rule. Just do it. And there are three levels of this. First of all, pick juries. If you can't pick juries, if you don't pick juries, how do you practice picking juries? Well, you can talk to people. You know, go up to the guy on the street and say, hi, I'm Mark, what's your name? Get out there and, and talk to people, interact with them. The second level is to pick your own jury. Don't let the judge do it. And if you're in federal court, try to get the ability to pick, to pick that jury. And if the judge covers topics that, that are important to your telling of your story, then talk about those topics yourself. Don't rely on the judge to tell part of your story for you. 
Finally, get up there and talk. When you pick a jury, just, just, just get up, just do it. Just don't be afraid of these 60 people. They're not going to bite you. Just do it. I had a report last week of a Houston lawyer, inexperienced lawyer, first jury trial, who got someone else to do voir dire for her. Now, she was going to try the case, but she was afraid to talk to the jury panel, and she got a more experienced lawyer to, to voir dire the panel for her. That's the one part of the trial that, that you have to do yourself. I mean, you can, you can foist off the cross-examination of a witness on somebody else, uh, direct examination on somebody else, closing argument even on somebody else. But voir dire, you've got to be the one to talk to. If, if it's your case, you've got to be the one to talk to the jurors. Rule number two, the blind date rule. Treat jury selection like a blind date with 60 people. Okay, so what does that mean? What it means is you're trying to learn enough about them that you know whether you want to hang out with them anymore. And you're trying to get them to like you enough that if you want to hang out with them anymore, they want to hang out with you anymore. So you come in and you know very little about them. You've been set up on this blind date by the district clerk. And there are these 60 people here. And so behave as though you are interacting with human beings, because you are, and they're human beings who are going to make judgments of you, and, and you want to find out about them, but you also want them to maybe find out about you, a little bit about you, but more importantly, to, to like you and to want to come back and spend more time with you. Rule three is the Shrek rule. I kind of got off to a bad start yesterday, and I wanted to make it up to you. I mean, after all, you did rescue me. Ah. Uh. Thanks. Well, eat up. We've got a big day ahead of us. Shrek? What? It's a compliment. Better out than in, I always say. <laughs> but it's no way to behave in front of a princess. Thanks. She's as nasty as you are. <laughs> you know, you're not exactly what I expected. Well... Maybe you shouldn't judge people before you get to know them. All right. So the Shrek rule is not don't judge people before you get to know them. The Shrek rule is better out than in. My, in my family, when, we, when we're eating out and somebody finds a hair in their food, we say, fantastic. Why is that? Because whether we had found it or not, the hair was in the food. Right? So when we're picking a jury, it's better that the stuff comes out. It's better that we hear the stuff that, that just makes us cringe, makes us shrivel up like a slug with salt poured on it, than that we don't, because it's there. And if we don't hear it, it's going to come out in the jury room. So the Shrek rule is better out than in. When we, if, we, if we are just getting love from the jury, there's something wrong. We're missing something. What we're looking for is the stuff that they want to, you know, that, that makes them want to kill us, to kill our client, to kill the state. What we're looking for, what we want to hear is the bad stuff. And people say, well, I don't want them to poison the entire panel, so I want to shut that down. No, you don't. You want to hear that, and then you want to get, you want to hear from the other people on the panel who feel the same way. You want to accept what the, you want to accept the bad stuff, and then say, okay, how many of you agree with Mr. Jones when he says that uh, the fact that my client has uh, a tattoo on his face suggests that he might have committed this uh, jailhouse murder? All right? Um, so, better out than in. We're turning over rocks, and we're excited to see what's under the rocks. We're like, you know, we're like my, my daughter was when she was about five years old and going out in the country and, and uh, you know, down by the creek. She's, she just wants to see what's under those rocks. Now, she'll pick up the rock and, and, ew, it's gross. But she's so excited to do it. That's really what she wants. She wants to see the gross stuff. And she'll make a big show of, oh, man, I didn't, really didn't want to see that. And then she'll go pick up, flip over the next rock that has other gross stuff underneath. We're looking for the gross stuff underneath the rocks. And a federal judge does a bad jury selection because the federal judge doesn't look for the gross stuff underneath the rocks. The federal judge discourages people from showing the gross stuff underneath the rocks. So better out than in. Rule four is the 90-10 rule. 
don't lecture. And uh, uh, I think Richard and, uh, and David both said this in their Vordire, uh, their DWI Vordire talk. Don't lecture. I can tell a good Vordire from a bad Vordire, whether I'm conducting it or somebody else is, by listening to the voices. If I hear the lawyer's voice talking 90% of the time and the potential jurors talking 10% of the time, I know it's a bad Vordire even if it's me. If I get myself in that position where I'm talk, talk, talking and then getting short responses from the jury, that's a bad voir dire. If I hear the jury talking 90% of the time and the lawyer, me or somebody else, talking 10% of the time, that's a voir dire that's working. We're getting information from the jurors. We're not lecturing them. We're having conversation with them. We're guiding their conversation amongst themselves. 90-10. Rule five. There we go. Is the McCarthy's bar rule. Is Paul Smith here? Hey, Paul, you recognize this place? Anybody else recognize this place? All right, this is the, uh, this is the Rustic Pine Tavern in Du Bois, Wyoming. And, and graduates of the Trial Lawyers College, like Paul, are going to recognize that place. McCarthy's bar rule is an homage to Terry McCarthy of Chicago. Terry says, talk in a courtroom like you would talk in a bar room. And then he says, a nice bar, not these places with sawdust on the floors, referring to our bars in Houston. McCarthy's bar rule, talk like a human being. Talk like you're in a bar room. Uh, don't use big words. Don't use fancy phrasing. I am probably worse about violating this rule than anybody, just because of the way my brain works. I like the big, the big concepts. I like, the, you know, I like to think about the the rules, and I like to think about the science of it, and that really has no place when I'm talking to a jury. So I have to remind myself, McCarthy's bar rule, talk like I'm in a bar room. Rule six is improv rule one. I've studied a lot of improvisational theater, uh, which is theater without a script, and the script is an impediment. And I think that's true in jury selection as well, that the script is an, is an impediment. You can't go in there and say, okay, these are the questions that I'm going to ask, and then I'm going to get answers to these questions. Now, you might get the answers to the questions, but you're probably going to be violating the 90-10 rule in the course of it, because if you have the, the conversation planned out, that means you're doing most of the conversing, right? And going back to the blind date rule, you don't go into the blind date saying, okay, these are what I'm going to ask her about herself, and this is what I'm going to tell her about myself, and this is the script I'm going to follow. The script is an impediment. You should have topics you're going to talk about, and after you've been doing it a while, you probably have those topics without even writing them down. But beyond that, you can't. You can't script, jury, uh, you can't script a good jury selection. You could script a, an interview of 60 people where they answer yes or no or, or even give you scaled answers to questions, but that doesn't get them talking. Improv rule two is don't well, block. Working on yes and on how to uh, make offers, accept people's offers, and add on to them. Um, this is an activity called Yes and Adventure, a great simple exercise to work those yes and muscles. We really want to um, drill yes and and get really used to it as a beginning improviser so it becomes second nature to really accept other people's ideas and add on them. Uh, so here's how this works, Yes and Adventure. Um, uh, Shannon's going to say the first line of adventure. Uh, some, something simple that's going to lay out. Okay, so the improv rule is yes and. When your partner, who's whoever's on the stage with you, uh, offers something, gives you some idea, some part of the story, you never reject it. You don't block. You take that. You say, okay, so, so in an improvisational scene, um, you, know, you have something, you might have something in mind, and you probably do have something in mind. Just like in Bordeaux, you might have an idea of where the conversation is going to go. And so in improv, I might be thinking, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, pol I'm a bartender, and I'm polishing the bar. And my partner says, well, that was a lovely moonset we had here on Mars today. And suddenly, instead of being a bartender in the Old West, I'm a bartender on Mars. And I can't say, are you crazy? This isn't, uh, the, this isn't Mars. This is the Old West. I have to take it, and I have to go with it and build on it. Okay? So that's... Yes, and. You take what your, what your partner, and in Vordire, the partner is the jury, 
You take what they give you and, and you build on it instead of rejecting. What we're doing, like uh, walking through the forest or going to the beach or in the jungle, something like that. Give us a little bit of a place. And then I'm going to say, yes, and, and I'm going to finish the line. And I'm also going to be acting out the story as we go. And then Shannon's going to say, yes, and, and he's going to act out the story. And so we're going to go back and forth, kind of both of us on adventure together. Nothing's going to happen kind of between us. We're not going to have any conflict. We're just going to both experience this adventure together. So let's get started. Well, Jennifer, X marks the spot, and I think that this is it, where the treasure is. Yes, and let's get our shovels and start digging for the treasure. Y yes, and I've got gloves to protect our hands from blisters. Oh, uh, yes, and um, I've got super digging strength from all my weightlifting practice. Yes, and I have X-ray vision that can see through this sand, and the treasure is definitely there. Yes. Okay, so, so you get the idea. It's yes and. You, you take the, what the person offers you and, and you build on it. So at any point, either of them could have violated this first rule of, of improvisational theater and said, no, you don't have super strength. You know, we're ordinary people. And it would have killed the scene. Now, you know, not, not a lot is happening in this scene, but it's a story that's building up. They're starting to tell the story together. And by the way, I recommend that for, being, for picking juries and for, for being a trial lawyer generally, that you learn lots of other stuff. I mean, I study martial arts, and I study improv, and I study acting, and, and I've studied singing. And, and all of it, I think, wow, you know, there are lessons here that are applicable to, to being a trial lawyer. You know, I read a book about dog training, and I think, oh, yeah, you know, that's kind of like cross-examination. So rule eight is the shrink rule. A yes or no question is not as good as an open-ended question. And the best open-ended questions are generally, and it depends on the topic, how do you feel? Because how do you feel engages the jurors' hearts and their guts rather than just their brains? What do you think engages their brains. And what we really want to get is a feel for these human beings. We don't want to just know how they logically think. We want to know how they're going to react to the story that we're going to tell. So how do you feel? How do you feel about, how do you feel about illegal drugs? And that's going to capture the people who have strong feelings about illegal drugs in a better way than how many of you have had a family member or close personal friend who's had a problem with illegal drugs. Because if you say, Ms. Smith, how do you feel about illegal drugs? Ms. Smith is going to access what's in here rather than up here. And if family member with problem with cocaine is part of what's in here, what she feels, that's going to come out. How do you feel gets people talking? How do you feel is in keeping with the blind date rule? Because people know that we're important. People know that we think that they're, that they're important, that we feel that they're important, when we ask them how they feel. In a way that, that, you know, what do you think could be a pollster calling about something? How do you feel is a more, well, it's a more personal question because of what we access when we're asked that question. The shrink rule also is in keeping with the 90-10 rule. Because if you ask somebody, how do you feel about um, drinking and driving? you're going to get a more lengthy answer, chances are, than if you ask them, um, you know, how many of you have had problems with people who have been drinking and driving? Rule nine is the beer pong rule. The beer pong rule is this. The ball is always in play. When a juror gives you an answer that you don't like or that you do like, that's the ball. And you don't just say, okay, well, great, I got an answer that I like or I got an answer that I don't like and let the whole thing drop. You got to keep that ball in play. So Ms. Jones says, uh, you know, I feel that, that uh, illegal drugs, uh, that there ought to be the death penalty for possession of illegal drugs because they're so harmful to our society. I think we ought to be just like Singapore. Now I'll make a note of that and, and uh, actually I'll have somebody make a note of that and, and uh, I might want to explore whether I can cause her out, 
Uh, but I also want to find out who has reactions to that either way. Do any of you disagree with Ms. Jones? How many of you agree with Ms. Jones that we ought to be like Singapore and we ought to have the death penalty for possession of drugs? And keep that ball in play. So Ms. Jones has, has given me this, this, this lob that I can take in lots of different directions and you know, respect the answer. I'm glad that Ms. Jones gave me this answer. I turned over that rock and man, looked at the, the copperhead that was underneath it. Uh, and maybe there are other copperheads. Or maybe there are people there who can start telling part of my story by disagreeing with Ms. Jones. Rule 10 is the marathon rule. Save something for the end. That is, try not to just peter out. Save something so that you've got one last question that, that kind of brings it all together so that, that uh, uh, the jury doesn't feel like things have just ended. And that's something that I, I might use a scaled question for. You know, I, I appreciate all your time, all of your good answers. I've got one more question. I just want to get, I want to get some numbers for you and then go through the audience. And, you know, maybe not the best way to end, but at least there's something where I'm, I'm definitively wrapping it up for the jury so they know, okay, this is it and it's over. Especially when you're the defense, you've already, you have a jury who's suffered through a judge's voir dire and who has given good answers to the prosecutor on their voir dire, and they're tired. They don't want to do this anymore. They see this all as part of the same thing. They don't look at it and say, okay, well, the prosecutor had an hour, so the defense lawyer should have an hour. They're thinking, okay, I have been here since 8 o'clock this morning, and it's 12.45 now, and these damn lawyers didn't get to us until uh, 11.30 anyway, and I just want to be done with this. Rule 11 is the playing doctor rule. It's not with insurance forms, co-payments, and malpractice suits it's just no fun. Now, the, the playing doctor rule is, if you want to see theirs, show them yours. If you want to know how they feel about things, tell them how you feel about things. If you want to know how they react to, to a particular issue that you might think might come up in your case, tell them how you react to it. You know, when I saw this guy with this tattoo on his face, I thought, whatever, it, whatever he is accused of, he must have done it. How many of you have the same thought, right? And, you know, it, that's the truth. That's the truth. And by telling the truth myself, I'm giving them permission to tell me their truth so that they're not, a, you know, they're not like in federal court, afraid to say, man, I saw that tattoo and I thought this guy's a thug and I'm not going to give him any benefit of the doubt. We can start discussing it. And you're going to have the jurors who say, yeah, I saw that. And, well, you know, what do you think about that? And you're going to have the jurors coming up on their own. Now, if I were the prosecutor, by the way, I probably wouldn't make that particular, uh, I thought this guy was a, a thug for life when I saw the tattoo on his face. But, but you've got your concerns about your own case and raise those concerns with the jury so that they can tell you why those concerns are unmerited. Because the jury wants you to, the jury wants you to feel good. The jury wants you to know that they're going to be fair. And so they're going to come up with the explanation for why you shouldn't have to worry about the t tattoo on your guy's face. All right. Got five more rules. There's the field trip rule, which is stay with the group. Uh, the group is the jury. These people have been together since 8 o'clock in the morning. They have formed relationships. They've had conversations. If you're the defense, by the time you get to them, they've had a conversation with the prosecution. You can't just go and take over. You've got to judge the mood of the group. You've got to see what they've talked about before. And you've got to guide the group the way that, that you want the group to go. To guide them, you have to first follow their lead. You see where they're going now. Rule 13 is the undertow tow rule, which is never swim alone. Always have somebody else there to pick a jury with you. Uh, I think prosecutors do this because prosecutors' offices generally have a, a younger lawyer who wants to learn from the older lawyer. A lot of us defense lawyers are solos. Guess what? There are still a lot of younger lawyers in town who want to learn from the older lawyers. There are older lawyers who want to learn from the younger lawyers. I have never watched a jury selection without learning something. So recruit somebody to help you pick the jury. Rule 14, the Atticus Finch rule. I am upset with my brother Tyrone for, for showing what this video clip, but I'm almost out of time anyway. I so the Atticus the Finch rule. Charged. 
The Atticus Finch rule is be the lawyer that they want to stand up for. Okay? Be Atticus Finch. Be the guy who, even though, even if he lost the case, they're not standing up because he won the case, because he didn't. They're standing up because he did the right thing, he told the truth, he stood up for principle. Whether you're the state or whether you're a defense lawyer, be that guy. Be the guy who the jury wants to stand up for. Don't be the guy who's sneaky, who's asking trick questions, who's trying to fool them into saying things that, that uh, get them off the jury or, or that you know, help your case. Be Atticus Finch. Rule 15 is the bat rule. Okay, that's the sound of a bat. I don't know what kind of bat. The bat rule is listen or starve. Bats send out these signals, but the signals don't give them any information until they come back. So in, in jury selection, the signals that we send out don't give us any information. It's the sin, sig, signals that come back that give us information. Listen or starve. Finally, and I'm a minute over, the herd rule. And this is why the question, uh, do any of you have religious beliefs that would keep you from judging another person. This is why I contend that's a poorly phrased question, even aside from the issue of whether it's a religious test. It's a poorly phrased question because studies have shown that if you ask, do any of you do something, you know, do any of you brush your teeth every morning, you're going to get fewer responses than if you ask, how many of you brush your teeth every morning? The takeaway here is that people like to be part of the group. And when you ask a question that makes it clear to these jurors or makes it seem to these jurors that they're part of a larger group, that presumes that they're part of a larger group, you're going to get more reactions than if you ask a question that makes them think maybe they're alone. And that can work, work both ways. If you want to get a lot of people to respond to your question, then you might ask, how many of you, whatever. If you don't want a lot of people to respond, if you're asking a question that might reveal people who sympathize with you, uh, you might ask, do any of you? Whatever. Because the jurors hearing the question, do any of you, are less likely to respond positively than the jurors who hear the question, how many of you? And that is the 16, maybe 17 simple rules for better jury selection. They are in your materials along with my paper on the law. Uh, online resources, there are several uh, jury experts who communicate on Twitter and, and have lots of useful information. Dennis Elias, Sunwolf out in California, uh, Rita Handrich, who I think is in Austin. And then there are blogs as well. Uh, check out my blog, defendingpeople.com or bennettandbennett.com. Uh, 